I was touring the floor and I was there to find clips, but it really just inspired me and realized that if I want to make it as a producer, or if I want to make it as anything, I, I need to own IP. Welcome to Global Vid, a podcast about original TV and film productions and its international potential. I'm your host, Eric Y. LaPointe. Let's learn from each other and the experts within our field. All right. Welcome to Global Vid. I am really happy to be here with uh, Jonathan Scogmo. He is the CEO of Jukin Media. How are you today? I'm doing good, Eric. How are you? I'm very well. So we are going to talk about your company, which has focused on user-generated content. And the acronym that we might hear throughout this episode is UGC. And so we'll we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But I would like, first of all, for you to introduce yourself and Juke Media to our audience. My name is Jonathan Scargo. I'm the founder and CEO of Juke Media. Started the company about 12 years ago. And we're a next generation media company. So everything we do is powered by user generated content. Content that's created a lot on these mobile devices, photos, videos that we find very valuable over at Juke that we can further help monetize, distribute, tell stories, allow other folks to tell stories. And so we've created some really great brands. Uh, we've created some really great shows. So I think you you hit the nail on the head there. But let's assume that maybe half of the audience don't n- really know what user-generated content is. Can you please define that a little bit further? It's kind of crazy because it's been part of my world for, like I said, the last 12 years. Everything I do evolves around user-generated content. The whole company's base of that. And as I mentioned, it's a lot of content that is not shot professionally by cinematographer, videographer, director. It's actually shot a lot by everyday people. These are moments that I believe are really organic, 100% organic, non-manufactured, authentic, kind of like caught on camera moments is what we consider UGC. It could be in a video form. It could be in a photo form, but it's really just shot by everyday people at the end of the day. And given how great technology is, the proliferation of GoPros, mobile devices, Nest cameras, Ring cameras. This content is everywhere. With your brands, you've managed to group that content together in a really beautiful way and and package it in, in a way that makes it look even better than that one piece of content. And I think that all started with Fail Army, if I'm not mistaken. Well, certainly one of our brands are a great way of take this user-generated content and create longer stories, whether we are putting together these videos in a compilation, in a montage, we are doing extra production around that, whether it's sound effects, graphics, adding hosts, creating formats. So these brands that we've created are content brands that are mainly socially distributed, but we've been investing heavily in kind of the OTT fast channel world as well. And you mentioned Fail Army. That's right. That's one of our, not only is it our biggest brand today, but I believe it was really our first brand to really take off, which is our, we consider our comedy brand uh, of people kind of laughing at themselves um, at the misfortune of some things that they're doing. How many YouTube followers does Fail Army now have? I'm not sure exactly on the YouTube count. I think it's probably at 12 or 13 million. Uh, but total, it's over 15 million when you add up all of the social platforms. YouTube is the platform where we first started out on, Fail Army and, and the company. They were one of the first, you know, obviously video platforms out there to get mass awareness and mass viewership. And so we really leveraged YouTube to create a, a brand, create a loyal audience, uh, an audience that follows us on many other platforms that we're now on today, which includes Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter. You know, we try to be on every every platform. We try to be ubiquitous as possible and distribute our content on all the social platforms, OTT, fast channels, and own operator websites. And, and here's the fascinating thing. And then we'll talk a little bit more about your background after this, and we'll come back to your company. But you also took Fail Army and turned it into a TV show with I don't know how many seasons, and that became an international success as well. Yeah, Fail Army, yeah, it has a huge international audience. So when we when you talk about MIPCOM, for example, it was a great platform, a great place to help distribute the show. We partnered with a company called Dick Clark, uh, Dick Clark Productions that help us 
not only deficit finance and production, but also help us distribute that. We produced the show in-house over at Jukin. It went off, we went off doing uh, 140 episodes, which was about seven seasons. And it aired in broadcast in over 200 markets around the world. And so Fail Army, the TV show, was a huge success for us. It spun off into two broadcast television shows, one for the UK and one for Fox. But it was the, the birth of Fail Army had, had exploded internationally. I don't know how many times I've walked into a coffee shop or a restaurant or something and Fail Army showed up. Who knows if they're paying their dues, but <laughs> but Fail Army is definitely all over the map. So let's take a step back and talk about your background and and basically what inspired you to get into this new space 12 years ago in, in UGC content. Yeah. So, you know, my background, I, I went to film school and always wanted to be in media entertainment industry originally from Chicago. It's not known for having the biggest media entertainment, but it, it certainly has grown over the years. But I just knew I had to be in L.A. And one of my first jobs in L.A., I just stumbled upon through a reference of a very lucky after struggling for, for a few months, but it was to be a researcher on a clip show. Uh, I didn't know what it meant to be a researcher. I didn't know what a clip show was, but this was like uh, America's Funniest Home vi Videos. It was a derivative version of that. Um, and my one of my first jobs was to go to the P.O. Box every day and pick up VHS tapes that people used to send in. So at the end of every episode, we had a call to action, send in your tape, send in your video to this, to this P.O. Box. And I was the one going to the P.O. Box every day and picking up these large bins of these really big envelopes. And I would open up the envelopes and I would tear them up. And, and I had a VHS player on my desk and watch these VHSs. A lot of the footage was bad. I remember these envelopes smelled really bad. Had an awful smell, some of them, coming from <laughs> mid-America. I don't know why. But if they were any good, I would write down the phone number and call the person up because they would put their phone number on the tape and I say, hey, we like this footage, want to license it from you. And I would do the clearance work behind that and send some paperwork. And I would say, hey, can you send it more footage if we want to tell a bigger story? And they would do that. But it was a very archaic method of uh, talking about YouTube and online video. It, it really didn't exist or was at the very 1.0 early stages. And right now we can watch any video we want online, but back then you really couldn't. There was a lot of issues with, with the technology, with high-speed internet, with the buffering of videos. And so, but still, 2005 was still archaic and thought there had to be an easier way than this because it would take two weeks to clear a single video. And just me being the person I am, trying to think of different methods because the other method was there's a lot of stock footage houses out there and they would send in, they would send me a VHS tape or a beta tape that I had to convert to, to VHS to watch it. And it had burnt in time code, as you know, and I had to write down the time code and then ask them, hey, can you send some more footage of that? And send the master. And again, that took weeks. So I just figured this is just an archaic method being it's 2005. And, and me being the person I am, I, I stumbled across this website that was hosting a lot of videos that actually seemed family friendly. It also seemed like you could contact a person uh, because a lot of the early online videos was a lot of kind of jackass wannabe stuff, shocking videos, kind of mixed with softcore porn. It wasn't very family friendly. You didn't know what these websites were or what they were all about. You certainly couldn't direct messaging the poster. And then there's this one website that actually was pretty clean. It looked family friendly. And I thought maybe I could, you know, direct message the person. And, and I did that. I got an answer right away. And I said, hey, can we use your video for the show? And that platform was called YouTube. And so I uh, kind of just stumbled upon that and became an early adopter of online video and YouTube and really just learned the platform, realized I can help monetize content for content creators, uh, people who are creating content for the very first time. My boss has told me I'm crazy for doing that and I should just go to the appeal box, but I ended up getting a lot more content this way. Next thing you know it, I was on the very next season, I became a producer of the show. And, and you can just go through that content so much faster, like just fast forward, skip oh, yeah. the video. When we wanted a, a tape, we would get, you know, when we wanted, you know, some of these stock footage houses or some of these footage houses that had home videos that were from the early 90s or late 80s, they would they would send in these kind of burnt in, you know, these these screener tapes that were, again, just so archaic with a burnt in top code. And it just took so long. It makes me realize that the quality of like the, you know, the earlier 
seasons of Americans funniest home video. I didn't, we didn't even think about it at the time because we would watch these on Sunday night or whatever it was when it was running at, at like what in the late nineties, maybe. And, and early two thousands still runs today and still runs today, which is, which is very true, but it makes me realize that the quality of that footage, if it was taken from VHS tapes, must have been just horrific at times. Yeah, but it's still people still loved it. And if you remember, it had the kind of the date sometimes, 1988 in the corner, uh, walking on a Sunday night. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's amazing how people just really love this content and always will love this content. Yeah. Uh, America's Funny Home Videos is a great model. Shows that it still works 30 something years later. And now these shows can finally be HD because obviously everybody's phone has become a camera and uh, HD cameras. So I'm, I'm assuming your job has become easier with time. Yeah, it certainly has. And it's just amazing how this content evolves and the career economy evolves. When you look at America's Phone Home Videos, I think it took them 25 years to pay you know, $10 million to their uh, video owners. I think we did it in like three or four years. Hi there, this is Michelle Simone Miller from Mentors on the Mic podcast. Every week I share an interview with an incredible mentor in the entertainment industry. I focus on how they started and how they moved up to where they are today. People like showrunner and co-creator of Friends, Marta Kaufman, five-time Emmy-winning producer and director Rob Burnett, who is the head writer of The Late Show with David Letterman at only 29 years old, to actor-director Tony Goldwyn from Scandal. We learn together how these incredible mentors started their first job and any advice they have along the way check out mentors on the mic wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe comment and share the global vid podcast now what inspired you to take these brands internationally you know i talk about how i just kind of had a very at a very early time just kind of really understood the power of user generated content and certainly the power of these platforms, uh, the power, again, of these mobile devices of people creating content on these devices and the way technology has changed. Is it was easier for folks to consume content than ever before. It's either easier for folks to create content because of these social platforms, because of uh, technology got better. And you could also realize when you talk about people consuming content, they were not just consuming in the United States. They were consuming this content internationally. And what's so good, particularly around uh, Fail Army, for example, it is language agnostic at the end of the day. I can say an ouch is an ouch in any language. A guy getting kicked in the you know what hurts. So this, this content works so well internationally that you don't need to dub it over. It's very physical. Some of the best videos are physical, whether it's a cat video, a cute kid is a cute kid in anywhere, or a funny cat or a dog doing something in, in any country is still funny. And so because there's so much physicality to a lot of our content, it speaks no languages. It is so universal. And so when we were when we program our content on our social platforms or, or OTT, we can really look at that data. And uh, what was so interesting, I think, when I talk about Mitcom, when we brought Fail Army out to the market for distribution in 2013, 14, we actually brought a one sheet out where it said all of the data from the different markets in different territories. And it was the first time I think these buyers saw that. And at first they were like, I don't want cannibalization. You know, I don't want to interfere with what, what, why would they watch something? On, if you can watch the video on YouTube, why do you want to watch it on TV? But we repackaged it. We repurposed differently. It wasn't the same viewing experience. And so it was really awesome to go to the market in Mipcom and give them data. And they've never seen that before, which I thought was just really cool. Yeah, I, I remember doing something very similar when I was working at Just for Laughs. We were using our YouTube channel data, you know, to show how popular it was in certain countries. And that's something that most producers just simply can't produce because they or they can't deliver because, uh, well, it doesn't exist online. Exactly. Yeah. They don't have the audience. And they weren't, I think people were afraid, buyers were afraid to buy it. Again, for the same reason, cannibalization. But also sellers just, they didn't have the, the capability. They didn't have access. The access either didn't exist or they didn't have the opportunity to sh showcase that, incubate that in front of the digital audience. Let's go back now to Juke and Media and founding this company back in, you said 2006, 
correct? 2005, 2006, when I started producing these user generated shows. And I did that for about, you know, four, four or so years. I was producing a handful of clip shows as clip shows became more popular. Uh, online video became more popular. Like I said, it was easier to create content than ever before, easier to consume content. And so these clip shows got really popular, particularly during the writer's strike, if you remember in 2008. And so I was jumping from job to job, freelancer, on from clip show to one clip show. And I was working for MTV, True TV, CMT, uh, all the T's. Uh, and it was at Discovery where I was working for a show with, uh, with Pilgrim. We were doing two versions, a U.S. version and an international version. And so we needed international stories. And they sent me out to Midcom for the very first time. I'm thinking, listen, I'm a producer in L.A. I'm a freelance producer. I'm working 12-hour days, working extremely hard. I understand the value of this content, but I didn't really understand the whole world of IP and the importance of IP ownership and formats until I went to Midcom. And I go to Midcom for the first time. I think I'm leaving the country, I'm crossing the Atlantic for the first time in my life, going to France, in the south of France, and I'm here, and I'm seeing the biggest media companies in the world, you know, from HBO to NBC Universal to these small Japanese, you know, programs, uh, TBS I've never heard of, you know, Fuji. Small but small, big. big. Yeah, small but <laughs> big. It was a whole new world that I never knew. Now you know I know all the networks, but... Back then, I'm like, what the hell is this? And realizing the importance of ownership of IP and that, again, there's a lot of this content is language agnostic and clip shows particularly is language agnostic. And so I was touring the floor and I was there to find clips, but it really just inspired me and realized that if I want to make it as a producer or if I want to make it as anything, I, I need to own IP. And it can't just be me freelancing or anyone freelancing. It's like the lifeblood of any big media company is the intellectual property. You look at Disney, I mean, they have Star Wars and Marvel and, and, and all their characters. And, you know, some of the biggest media companies live and die by their that IP. As you know, it's hard to own IP. You have to create the show, finance it yourself. It takes a lot of luck. They don't give it to you, especially the nope. U.S. networks. If you come off the show, you're selling it to the U.S. network and, and they're not... You're not getting any piece of that, or it's very hard to, it's very rare unless you're really established. But starting out, I realized that I needed own IP, but how can you do that? And I was saw a show that I helped produce being sold to different territories in one of those booths. Show that I put together my blood, sweat, and tears, my 14, 14 hour days, and realizing that, you know, uh, I don't get paid on any of this. I'm a freelance producer. So, you know, I can work every day that week and I can call in sick one day the next week. I don't get paid because that's just the world of freelance. And I certainly don't get any royalties from that. And so if I can't own a format, I can't create a show and finance it myself. Maybe I can own all those kind of little assets that make up a show. And my access to clips and understanding the clip show world and the marketplace for clips I realized that I could start buying the rights, the IP to these individual videos or getting the exclusive rights. How long after did, was Juke Media born then? It was pretty much there. I was moonlighting. I was doing it at night while I was working on this other show and did that, you know, I was doing both jobs for about four or five months and I'm realizing that, you know, if I want to try, I was kind of tired of just exhausting working for someone else working for, for being in the, in the production schedule and just realizing I could just start buying in these individual videos and then relicensing them back to these kind of production companies and networks that I used to produce for. And I knew the cost of the clips. I knew I could buy them and what I could buy them for and then what I could relicense them for. Obviously, I had to do all the clearance work and, and, and certainly you know hire an IP attorney and get all those ducks in a row, which I did. But I realized that there could be a business here, me kind of being the middleman. I could be the, the Getty Images of viral videos, of user-generated content. And I would just hand curate that myself. It was probably six months after, or you know, at that trip, I came back and said, I'm gonna try this out for a few months and see if there's something here. And so the first kind of 2009, you know, ended and 2010 came and I said, maybe there's, there's a business here. And so I just started growing the library one video at a time and relicensing that and putting that, that cash flow and those profits right back into the business and just reinvested right back in the business and bought more videos and started slowly hiring a staff. And um, the business was always profitable from day one. And what were the milestones that you saw over the years that where you feel that somehow Juke and Media made it 
even like the first milestone, like perhaps your first few employees. Well, I think being a, a, an entrepreneur, you do have to celebrate those milestones. So I think that's that's a great question. And there's a few that come to mind. It was the first office. It was the second office. It was when we reached 30 employees. It was when we raised money, uh, some capital. And we got like Disney in as an investor. And we also did with a, a big deal with the company that they acquired called Maker Studios. It was a pretty big deal as we were helping, they were helping us monetize some of our assets. A few of those along the way, I think when Fail Army first launched internationally, when we sold the show to Fox, producing the show for Fox, there's always been these kind of really great moments. And, and obviously in any business, you know, there's a peaks and valleys and goes ups and downs and there's some bad times, but appreciate the, the milestones and, and those big moments are, are something that I really encourage other folks to do. Yeah, you, you definitely have to, because uh, obviously entrepreneurs will probably see the, the, the end game, but there's so much work to do before you even get there. Totally. And the end game Absolutely. might not even look like you had ever imagined. And the overnight success, you know, takes you 10 plus years. So, you know. So was there a moment for you where you said, okay, I'm successful now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I never said that. I mean, we were at our peak, we had nearly 300 employees, offices in New York, London, New Delhi. I don't think I've ever said that we were successful. I, I love the grind. I love being in every day. The stress is what I love and hate, but it also fuels me to be better. It's been an incredible journey. And I won't, you know, love to continue on that journey uh, for as long as, as, as my new bosses want me to. What are the other media brands that, that you guys focus on? So Jukin also manages, we create or bought a, a brand called the Pet Collective from Fremantle, which is part of the YouTube original. And I think when we acquired that brand, it was a million fans. And now it has, you know, close to 30 million or so, 35 million. You know, it was another example of a media company trying to get into digital and, and not being digital native. And so, you know, they're the biggest, you know, production, arguably the biggest production company in the world. And I'm very proud of what I've been able to do with that brand. And so we have the Pet Collective, we have People Are Awesome, which is the opposite of Fail Army, of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Yeah. We launched a new brand called Weather Spy, which started off on our fast channels, which is doing extremely well, which is kind of like weather, I call it weather attainment, but weather for a millennial audience. We live in such a dynamic world of weather and environmental issues. I think there needs to be more competition other than some of the other, I think, static weather brands out there. So we launched that. That's doing extremely well. We have a heartwarming brand called Poke My Heart. And with the new acquisition, so I'll, I'll segue into the next chapter in Jukin's history is that we were acquired by a company called Trusted Media Brands. And so we're now looking at their assets and helping managing their video strategy and, and investing in the video strategy. And that includes Reader's Digest, which is a 100-year-old brand, Taste yep. of Home, Family Handyman, our portfolio of brands just doubled overnight, which is super exciting. And it's super exciting to bring kind of our video assets and our know-how to a very editorial publishing brand as opposed to a video content brand that we've uh, helped build and serve. Yeah, it does sound like there's a huge opportunity for Jukin to mix that traditional experience and the hundred years of experience with everything you guys have grown in the last 12 years. And, and on the flip side, I imagine trusted media have a lot to gain as well, because uh, like you said, with Fremantle, they came to you because they weren't digital natives or they weren't focused on digital per se. What will trusted media gain from this on their end? When you kind of look at the companies in some ways, we couldn't be more different. And then you look at a company in some other ways, we couldn't be more similar. Uh, and I'll tell you what I mean by that is that this is a hundred year old readers, not just a hundred year old brand, but they're the ultimate curator of user generating content as well. As they get stories from their audience, they get photos from their audience, they get recipes from their audience. Same thing, we, we, wow. we, get, we get videos. They consider themselves a UGC company too, which is so cool. They are very strong in own and operated websites. They are strong in D2C. They are strong in first party data. We are not strong in operated websites. Like I said, we are socially distributed and agnostic to all these different platforms. 
We don't have a lot of first party data. We are too much dependent on the platforms and what data that they give us. So it's really kind of a perfect match of both these companies. I mean, we have two different pieces of a puzzle. And when you put together this puzzle, it becomes this beautiful horizon and, and really a lot of synergies. And, and so a lot of my focus these days has been on the integration work. And it's super exciting to put some, both these companies together. And it's going to be and it's a complete integration what we're doing right now. How, how did that deal come about? I knew one of the companies I was representing them on the on the buy side. I, I knew the one of the, the the bankers that was leading that effort as they were retained by TMB Trusted Media Brands to find video co- companies in the video space that had a strong video presence socially and on OTT and fast channels. And so, in 2020 of November, almost this time last year, where this banker approached me and said, "Hey, John, I have this company that." that I think would be perfect for you to find a home for Jukin. And I was not interested at all. I was like, 2020 was rough. It was rough on everyone. Like, I don't want to go through a, a selling process. Like, let me get mm-hmm. through this year. Like, we were lucky that, you know, we had a pretty good year from the better from the year prior. We survived. We actually didn't let anybody go. We hired bodies. At the same time, you know, early in the year, just like any other company in the world, we were thinking, how do we cut costs? How do we, how do we manage this? You know, people are not going to be able to pay their bills, people that owe us money. And so luckily everyone got through it and we got through it, you know, knock on wood really well, more than most companies. And I feel we're very lucky. We did a really great job execution, but it was exhausting from a management and leadership standpoint. And so I was not in any interest to talk to a, a buyer uh, and go through a process. And so I told yeah. the banker, tech time, you know, hit me up next year. And uh, to give her credit, she was very persistent in January 4th or whatever that Monday was, the first Monday of the new year, she hits me up like at 8 a.m. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> and then next year, I'm thinking, let's talk in March or April. And she, she sends me an email in, in January. And I kind of pushed that meeting off. She said, you got to meet the management team. I said, fine, I'll just do it because I'll do it as a favor. Thinking, you know, this is a legacy publisher. I didn't, I just, they just told me the name. I'd never even heard of trusted media brands before. I don't think they ever really heard of Jukin, but they were interested. But you had heard of Reader's Digest. You're not that young, Jonathan. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I'm excited about the 100th year anniversary, uh, which is going to be in February. I was not interested, uh, but... You know, I pushed the meeting off and just kind of did it as a, as a favor. And it, 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 it's amazing how well both management teams really clicked at that first meeting and seeing the opportunity. Everyone on our side, everyone on their side. And we said, OK, maybe there's there, there's something here. And so over the next few months, we thought maybe it might be an investment conversation, but quickly turned into an acquisition conversation for the full company. And it just made a lot of sense uh, from evaluation wise, from a strategic wise, because we knew that we had to do something different for us to grow. We were actually, we hired a bank ourselves to buy more assets. So I mentioned, I mentioned that, you know, fail was actually uh, an asset that we acquired very early on when it had 30,000 subscribers, we were able to grow up big, but I mentioned pet collective people are awesome was an acquisition for us. So we've had some success on these really small acquisitions. And so we actually hired a banker and we were talking, having a handful of conversations, realizing that we had to do something different. And us being acquired was not even in the cards. I didn't even think about it. I wanted to keep growing Jukin, but I actually think this is the best way to keep growing Jukin is through the, our partnership and with trusted media brands. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. W- one of the things you mentioned is fast channels. And, you know, before we, we end this episode. I, I'd love to maybe talk about a little bit about that, and and how you are now creating your own channels. So now, not only have you acquired the content, put it up online, put it into linear form, but now you're also creating your own channels. Yeah. So it's not just a linear television show; it's a linear network that's running twenty four seven. And so it's super exciting. We're seeing a lot of growth. In that area, we're going to continue to invest in that area, which is super exciting. But you know, Fail Army, we're we're running tw- we're running a twenty four seven network. People are awesome twenty four seven hour network. Pet Collective, Met Weather Spot, twenty four seven hour network of content that we're creating uh, that we're uh, repackaging and repurposing, purposing from individual libraries, creating thirty and sixty minute shows. We're licensing content in. 
And we're doing a lot of the traditional linear television methods of day parting, running marathons, interstitials, promos, promoting the channels to each other. I said we're licensing some TV shows in that are brand adjacent to the brands that we're creating, uh, that we've created. So it's it's super exciting what we're doing in that area. We're able to sell that to advertisers, sell the media, whether it's programmatically or doing direct deals with them. It's super exciting. I am convinced that channel sales and channel growth is the future of distribution. Like to put that into the control of the producers who can then take these brands elsewhere with different partnerships. Where can you find some of your fast channels? Yeah. So we're on Samsung Plus. We are on LG. We are on Peacock. We are on Roku, Pluto. We were one of the first channels to launch on Pluto and they've seen massive success particularly after their Viacom with the Viacom acquisition. Right. I think we're on like uh, two dozen, I think, platforms around the world, which is, which is super exciting. And so it's international and growing that internationally as well. So what's next for you, Jonathan, in 2022 or, or for Juke and Media? Well, I think all everything that I mentioned, continue to invest in our current brands, launch new brands, bringing some of the trusted media brands into video world, get them a lot more focused on video, create fast channels for them. We want to continue to create more linear television shows where we've seen success. Right now we have a show on a and called Neighborhood Wars, which is one of their biggest shows uh, to premiere. Neighborhood Wars, we're in the second season of that. We're doing a spinoff of that. We're talking with a handful of other uh, networks about producing some original content. Uh, we're going to continue to produce original content for our own business, for internally, whether it's for social or the fast channels. We are continuing to acquire content and working with other user generated content libraries that have popped up over the years and represent their libraries. Uh, we're opening it up to the more creator, I think, economy, where we believe we've paid over $35 million to video owners uh, since the existence wow. of Jukin. And so I'm really proud of that. And so how do we continue to build upon that? Well, it sounds exciting. It sounds like you can go beyond the sky. <laughs> I hope so. You normally say sky is the limit, but it sounds like uh, you're about to embark on something really big for, for further growth. And I, I'm here to hope to, that Trusted Media Brands becomes a billion dollar company. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for spending uh, your hour with me today. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck with uh, these new projects and your partnership. I'm sure it's going to go well. Thank you, Eric. I really appreciate the questions. Thanks. And that concludes today's episode of Global Vid. Thanks to our guest, Jonathan Scogmo of Jukin Media. And as always, thanks to our editor, Nicola Maida, and our theme song composers, Amber Goodwin and Aaron Ross. See you next time.